uh, do we best? How uh, is it possible to perform a, a, a proper or like efficient or adequate uh, reinterpretation of uh, collider searches in the context of the LHC, and in particular to long lived particles, which is uh, a topic that uh, I am very interested in. So uh, just a brief outline of the talk. First, I want to motivate the importance of doing this recasting or this reinterpretation of current searches, or perhaps to propose optimizations of new searches, being able to target signatures of your uh, BSM model of interest. What are the challenges? Uh, I want to give an example of uh, one of my latest works in the context of the minimal uh, heavy neutral lepton model and comment a little bit about our uh, particular recast that we did to this model. And also want to uh, tell you about a method that we propose to reinterpret uh, uh, models predicting LLPs, long lived particles, but when they are produced from meson decays. And I think this is interesting because uh, we found that you can apply this method to provide some assumptions that I will detail to basically uh, any model uh, in which uh, long lived particles are predicted from meson decays. And then just to wrap up uh, one slide. Okay, so this is my motivation. Why do we want to reinterpret uh, new physics searches in the context of different models? Well, we have many theoretical frameworks uh, that are able to explain uh, uh, things that we want to explain in nature, that we know new physics must be out there. We don't understand the mechanism behind neutrino masses. We don't know what dark matter is, uh, the matter antimatter asymmetry in our universe. We can also not explain. Perhaps you want to build a model able to address some anomaly uh, and so on and so forth. And your particular model may not always uh, being looked for at a high energy physics experiment. And this happens also beyond the LHC, right? And the reasons why uh, this is this happens, well, maybe there is not an optimal analysis strategy uh, within the experiments. Uh, the experimental searches take a lot of effort, a lot of person power, time, resources, so it's not possible to cover all of the VSM possibilities. Uh, perhaps uh, your model yields very striking signatures and there is not even an existing detector able to catch your hypothetical particles. Here I'm thinking of long lived particles that can travel, let's say 100 meters before decaying that will fall outside of the acceptance of uh, current, uh, let's say uh, standard purpose LHC detectors. So uh, the fact is uh, that the amount of experimental results is much less than the theoretical models we are able to construct in some physics. So uh, there is a need for reinterpretation, uh, reinterpretation of uh, LHC search results or any uh, other uh, results from a high energy physics experiment will help to close the gaps in coverage of uh, your landscape of possibilities within your BSM theory. And in particular, I, I, I try to summarize here uh, what, uh, what I do, basically, what do particle phenomenologists or, or theories, people outside these uh, experimental collaborations, what they can do to perform reliable uh, interpretations, uh, reinterpretations uh, of uh, experimental results. And basically you start with your model, with your Lagrangian and your, your different parameters. Uh, you basically, maybe you wanna code this model uh, in order to simulate a signal. You need to identify what is the production of your new uh, hypothetical particle, what are the AK modes, uh, perhaps uh, define observables, variables, uh, et cetera. And then you, what you usually do is uh, rely on HEP software, standard Monte Carlo tools to generate signals, backgrounds. And then you need to start thinking, okay, what would be the experimental response to these objects? You simulate the detector effects, you implement your 
uh, variables and your cuts in your analysis in order to get a, an expected signal or expected number uh, of events. Uh, and then you change your masses, your couplings, you cover uh, other phenospace in your model and then you reproduce this chain. And in order to quantify the experimental response, you need experimental input. There is dedicated software nowadays, like DELS, for example, that allows you to simulate these effects. What is an electron? What is a jet? And usually the experiment, if you want to perform a reinterpretation, there are two options. So either you rely on extensive information from the experiments. So this is like usually provided in the form of auxiliary material in the publications, like efficiencies, that are parameterized in some of these observables, depending on your analysis, that would be of interest. Uh, perhaps the experiments gives you a cut flow table that uh, you want to validate to be sure that your simulation is working OK. Uh, and in principle, we need a very extensive amounts of information if you want to be sure that uh, you are simulating either the benchmarks they are, they are simulating properly or if your extrapolation is going to be reliable. So this is not always easy. It uh, relies on a lot of technical work. And I will give one example of a search that we're reinterpreted in this way in what follows. But the other way, and this is the second work I want to talk about, is that maybe we can think of new ways to recast without relying on all this complicated experimental input and perhaps one can think of a methodology or a method uh, that can work only from Monte Carlo truth information. And this will be the, the last part of the talk. Okay, uh, so let me comment a little bit about the challenges that uh, the, the, the pipeline that I showed you before has. So when you think about LAC searches, we can classify them in prompt searches. These are searches where uh, that are designed to look for uh, BSM particles that are being produced in the proton-proton collisions and then decay immediately, very quickly, to other known standard model stuff like nuance electrons or jets. Provided you know how to reconstruct all these visible objects for your detectors, then you can uh, reconstruct missing transfer momenta and then uh, okay, you are thinking about a new BSM process, you generate your signal, then you implement your cuts, perhaps you are trying to maximize uh, one of these observables, the amount of jets or the amount of missing momenta, and then you impose some selection cuts on, on transverse momenta, these things like this. You define where do you expect to find a signal in the perhaps low or high PT threshold region, you implement your cuts, you need think about the, the triggers, you need to validate your analysis. And like I mentioned, uh, nowadays there are many tools on the market uh, to, to perform this, uh, this um, reinterpretation or recast. This very streamlined for prompt searches, uh, software such as Checkmate or S-Models uh, provide already with some uh, uh, extensive list of analyses that uh, Basically, you can take and provide that you give some BSM model, they will tell you, OK, this point in your parameter space is excluded or not. Uh, but for LLP searches, uh, we are thinking about uh, predictions of uh, particles that are producing the proton-proton collisions, but they can travel uh, macroscopic distances inside your detectors. Uh, this can range from or their microns to several meters, and then they will decay somewhere in the acceptance of your detector. And depending on what the detector components are, uh, this will yield different signatures, such as displaced vertices, highly ionizing particles, uh, a jet that is displaced from the interaction point, etc. You also need to think about how to generate your signal, uh, what will be the trigger that you're going to use to catch these events, uh, but there are extra extra things you need to take care of, such as how will you handle the displacement in your event generation? This isn't something that is not always trivial. 
uh, what is the efficiency for uh, your object that is being produced very farther away? Uh, do you rely on track efficiencies? Do you need to perform a vertexing algorithm to quantify such displacement? Perhaps you think about the timing response. So there is not always uh, much information and there is not always a uh, one way to into which the experiments uh, present this uh, displays information. Uh, a lot of progress uh, has been made and I refer you to the LLP community white paper for some recommendations and, 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 and other challenges. But the, the bottom line is that there is no streamlined way of doing things. There is not no a very much standard way yet to do things. It very it's very analysis dependent, uh, so uh, you risk dangerous extrapolations if you just take a limit from an LLP search and say, oh, okay, maybe my model uh, also provides long lived particles, so I can also exclude this region for uh, because you do a one to one comparison from the benchmarks in the experimental paper but then there is the risk of, of these uh, extrapolations so validation is 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 really key so i want to provide an example of uh, one search that we reinterpret uh, with uh, with uh, with a model in mind that predicts uh, uh, long lived heavy neutral leptons this is the minimal framework. And uh, CMS did this analysis of something that uh, I like to call the displaced shower. So basically, uh, this is an event display of the CMS search. A displaced shower is uh, basically a bunch of hits in the CMS muon chamber that will look somehow like this. And uh, yeah, that's the displaced shower. So. CMS did this search uh, in the context of a, a standard model Higgs boson that decayed to light long-lived scalars, which could then decay to adronic stuff, including taus in the final state. Now, this search is, is quite inclusive and is sensitive to long-lived particles uh, decaying to hadrons, taus, electrons, or photons. Uh, and one of the advantages is that the, the CMS uh, muon system has a lot of steel, uh, which basically uh, relies as a background uh, suppressor, let's say. So this is a, a, a picture that I took from one of the CMS uh, 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 members that uh, was introducing this, uh, this search. So this is a, like, a slice of CMS, and you can see that this has many modules that are highlighted in green here that are called the cathode strip chambers. And if you have a long lived particle, uh, you can catch the decay because it will leave a bunch of hits uh, in these uh, green regions. And a muon will transverse completely all the way. So this is a very unique signature, and uh, there are two. Uh, variables, like I mentioned, the, the number of hits inside these uh, green uh, cathode strip chambers, uh, which are like clusters, and that you can identify this cluster of hits here, and it also relies on, on this intransitive momentum. So in this search, uh, CMS uh, uh, was very kind to provide instructions for reinterpretation. And this is something that uh, experiments are uh, more and more uh, uh, doing and, and phenomenology is pushing for reinterpretations also help to make the case for uh, experimental searches to release useful information. And if you go to the, the, the search uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the archive, there is a link to this auxiliary material website, and then you can find instructions as to how to quantify these clusters efficiency for an LLP as a function of uh, quantities that you can get from Monte Carlo information, such as the energy of your long lived particle, the decay distance, uh, etc. And it provides a series of ways to reproduce the cuts in the analysis. Now, we were interested in this search uh, because we are thinking of a, a model 
in which uh, sterile neutrinos or heavy neutral leptons uh, coupled mostly to taus. So we can produce uh, uh, heavy neutral leptons from the decays of W bosons at the LHC. And if you are constraining or thinking about constraining mixings in the tau sector, uh, then you will have final states with taus and jets, which uh, are seen by the experiments by aldronic activity. So basically, this is the benchmark that CMS used. Uh, they have several benchmarks in the paper, but this is the one that uh, kind of uh, highlights the, the first motivation that we have. Oh, we want to uh, catch displaced taus, basically, which in the CMS search uh, came from a long lived scalar, uh, and in our case, come from a, a heavy neutral lepton. Now, in order to perform this reinterpretation, uh, we need to basically define a, a new way to reconstruct these cathode strip chamber objects and the response of a long lived particle uh, decaying inside these objects. And uh, uh, one of the PhD students that were uh, from Fermilab, who was, she was working with us in this, and she actually implemented this uh, DELFS module that uh, is widely uh, uh, available. It's uh, basically, you can go to a GitHub repository that I put here, and you can use it to reinterpret perhaps your own BSM model in the context. If you have a signature that it will look like a lot of displays adronic activity in the final state. So this was a very nice and important efforts uh, for uh, helping in reinterpretation of LLP searches. Now, uh, one slide on, on, on this uh, minimal HNL model, that, like I mentioned before, this is, uh, we're thinking about sterile neutrinos or right-handed neutrinos. And this minimal kind of phenomenological model is motivated by neutrino masses. We have mixing with the standard model neutrinos and for uh, small enough values of this mixing and GeV scale masses, uh, yeah, you can have automatically long-lived HNLs. Um, if you go, so this is a process that uh, we are looking for. And there was a recent paper um, that basically shows a, a summary of current constraints, uh, almost almost current constraints. There's a new CMS search that constrains tau mixing. But if you compare the, the constraints already in mixings in the electron sector, for example, with mixings in tau sector, the tau mixing is less constrained than electrons and muons. So this is why we were interested in the first place to look at the displaced taus in the final state. Uh, and this is uh, our uh, prospects for uh, uh, the recast of, of this CMS uh, search. Now, once we did this, we did the plain reinterpretation. That means we did exactly uh, impose exactly the observables and the selection cuts that the experimentalists used. And this yields this blue line here. Uh, so when we saw this, we said, okay, uh, our estimation, uh, our, our interpretation basically already falls on top of the, uh, the regions of parameter space in this model already excluded by Delphi. So what can we do? So then you start to play around and try to optimize your search. So basically, we define several strategies in the paper, uh, uh, playing around with the two, the two key variables in this analysis that will basically maximize your signal and suppress backgrounds, which is the missing energy and the number of hits that you have in these clusters. And then uh, the, once we talked with uh, our experimental colleagues, uh, it turns out that CMS is, is, is thinking quite hard in, in, in trying to implement a new displaced trigger. You can see a review of these trigger proposals in this document here, uh, which uh, basically uh, for our case, this meant that we could go lower in thresholds of these two quantities in order to maximize the region of parameter space that we could exclude in this model. So this is, I think, a, a good example uh, of all the steps in the, in the workflow pipeline that I, that I showed you at the beginning, 
So you need to validate first, which means uh, getting this uh, blue curve here, the, the, the plane recast. Uh, and then once you have all your machinery into place, uh, you can optimize the, the search and say, look, uh, CMS, if you would have done a search for a long lived heavy neutral lepton that decays in this way, uh, with the same strategy that you use for uh, your Higgs border model, then uh, this uh, is able to exclude uh, low values of the mixing for GV scale neutrino uh, heavy, heavy neutral lepton mass that is not accessible with uh, other competitive proposals that uh, aims to search for uh, this channel as well. And here I'm highlighting the Mathusla uh, proposal, Phaser 2 and SHIP, which are the long-lived particle experiments that will provide the, the best sensitivity uh, for, for this mass range. So, so, so we, can, we can cover some previously uncovered space in, 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 model, in the model, uh, which is, I think is very nice. So I show you here these detectors, right? Mathus, Lafacer, et cetera. So the work I wanna comment on next is like, how can you do this reinterpretation of searches um, in a more, in a way that uh, you don't rely on all these complicated simulations, creating new Delft modules, et cetera. We need to think about uh, the future of long lived particle uh, phenomenology. And there are several proposed experiments to search for long lived particles. Some of them are, are even taking data already out of the LHC, such as Phaser uh, 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 and Model, uh, Model Map. Map is also proposed, is already approved uh, to be an extension of this model experiment. And these are far, forward detectors. So forward detectors are basically far away uh, from the proton-proton interaction collision and uh, light long-lived particles uh, will be uh, highly boosted in the forward direction. So maybe you put a detector there and you can catch them. Uh, there is also uh, uh, proposals to build uh, what uh, I call transverse detector, people call transverse detectors, such as Mathusla, which is a proposal to build a surface detector uh, on top of the LHC ring, 100 meters uh, on top of, uh, let's say, Atlas or CMS. So heavier long lived particles uh, uh, will be able to transverse in this, uh, uh, travel in the transverse direction and reach these uh, experiments. And there are other proposals as well, such as Anubis, uh, Codex B, et cetera. And all these proposals uh, uh, are situated or the, the the, the detectors are proposed to be built at different distances from the primary interaction uh, point. So I put this representative uh, graph here uh, so you can see how far away they are and kind of qualitatively uh, think about the, 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 the reaching mass for your LLP uh, uh, that you will get. So phaser kind of long, lighter LLPs Mathusla, Nubis, et cetera, uh, qualitatively higher uh, LLP masses. So for thinking about uh, what are the prospects for uh, heavy neutral leptons um, for lighter masses than the case that I showed you before. So before we were thinking uh, about the B-meson mass threshold, now we're thinking, okay, maybe our HNLs can be produced from meson decays. And what are the prospects for detecting these HNLs at the ongoing experiments and future far detector or transverse detector experiments? And you start with, uh, okay, what are the uh, number of expected signal events in your minimal HNL model that you can get at different uh, far detector experiments? So here, we overlay a present, I mean, uh, yeah, present bounds for HNS being produced from D mesons. Here, CHARM, uh, the CHARM experiment did a search for uh, HNLs in this mass region and provides this bound. Uh, expectations of coverage are greater for Mathusla, 
for instance, everything inside this curse is excluded. And for the case of uh, Venusons, uh, Bell is the ongoing uh, result uh, that we overlay here, and this is our, our prospects for the far detectors. Now, uh, there has been a lot of work on, on this topic uh, before. You can see some previous references here. But uh, our, our, the idea for the work that I want to comment on is, starts from these first prospects uh, wow. for, yes? Can I ask you something? Yes, of course. I'm a bit confused here, but it, we are model. We clarify exactly what you're doing. So the idea here is you assume that you have a certain channel in which the final state is produced, right? Yes. And then you assume a certain model and then change the parameters of the model. Yes, so basically here we are scanning a region in model parameter space for uh, uh, HNL masses uh, up until the 5 GV or so, from 10 to minus 1 to 10 GV or so, and several values of the mixing. Because for lighter uh, heavy neutral leptons and uh, small values of the mixing, this heavy neutral lepton uh, yeah. basically is very long lived. So there is hope to discover this guy at this future fire detector experiments. And there are two searches that were done in the past, uh, the ones that I mentioned from Charm and Bell, which look for this process and place those constraints that I'm showing in, in red and, and, and orange. So we are saying, okay, Charm and Bell search for these guys. They, they did not found anything. So basically we're saying, look, these are the projections of finding this guy or excluding this uh, space, uh, model parameter space under the, the assumption of the, that you didn't see uh, any signal. So these are so basically you are 95. Testing, you are testing a specific model. A specific yes, model. I'm talking, That's what you're testing, yes, I mean, this, yes. This I'm taking this model, yes. You are testing a specific model. Yes, the minimal model in which you have uh, heavy neutral leptons. So this mm -hmm. is basically mm -hmm. the interaction Lagrangian that we are considering. A very simple phenomenological yeah. model, only right. two independent parameters. Yeah. Okay. So what we want to do, but thank you for the question, because what we want, and this is the benchmark that uh, uh, the experimental searches are mostly targeting. Just one heavier uh, state, uh, that can couple to charge or neutral currents uh, and, and they provide the results uh, of their uh, exclusions for just this benchmark. What we are going to do now is saying, look, if you think about far detector experiments, you can actually uh, start from this minimal benchmark and then we can translate these bounds with the methodology that we propose to other more complete models, and I'm going to show you an example of uh, heavy neutral leptons with ineffective field theory. Okay, so this is very important because it provides you with the, uh, it addresses the motivations that I explained in the first slides, that uh, the LHC and future experiments or may not think about more complete models. So this is one particular example for the minimal HNL scenario. But the starting point is this, assuming that uh, uh, we have far detectors in the future, this is the parameter space of this minimal model, these detectors will be able to constrain. Uh, and then what can we do? Well, what we can do is first think about uh, something that I tried to kind of say before. It's very difficult to quantify, let's say the efficiencies. Uh, once you calculate, if you want to calculate this magical number, which is the number of expected signal events, here we th say, okay, this will be the number of HNLs that are being produced from the meson decay that you are considering times the branching ratio. 
of this guy to all visible final state times uh, your efficiency. Now, in our case, since we have a probability of this decay, uh, it's given by an exponential. Uh, the probability that this lonely particle will decay somewhere within your detector acceptance falls like an exponential. You can say, well, if we work in a limit uh, where this uh, exponential falls in the linear regime, which means uh, performing this approximation, your efficiency uh, is going to be proportional to this probability of decay. And this probability of decay uh, end up being a quantity that you can calculate only from your theory. The total decay width of your LLP within your theory, uh, the kinematical parameters uh, uh, relevant, such as the boost, the gamma factor, and uh, uh, the, the, the determined length or size of your far detector. So, this is what we are doing. We're saying, if you have a new model in which you calculate uh, the expected number of signal elements in that new VSM model, by computing, uh, by performing this approximation, and provided that you are considering a lonely particle that is being produced from the same meson to ensure the same kinematics of your process, uh, then you can uh, basically uh, provide an estimation for a different model. So this is what we did. Uh, but just a one slide on the model that uh, it's like the reinterpret model from the minimal scenario. What do you uh, mean by different model? I mean, because uh, it's always uh, the same uh, intermediate particle. I mean, I don't understand what you mean by a different model here. So this is the this is the model. So basically, we're thinking of systematically studying heavy neutral leptons, uh, but in an effective field theory approach. So basically, you can cons we consider uh, dimension six operators, uh, okay. uh, right? So it, once you start to consider operators with different number, let's say of heavy neutral leptons uh, or, 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 or of uh, number of fermions within your operator, then you open the possibility to, for example, have two heavy neutral leptons in your final state instead of one, which was the minimal scenario before. So uh, once you open up uh, the, the, the number of possibilities, this is one example. For example, you can produce an N by plus from a B plus decay. Uh, you can consider uh, several uh, uh, processes here. Uh, I put a table. So with the example processes, we are thinking of production from D zeros, B zeros, uh, B plus, and different decay modes. So now what is different is that the, the production, uh, your production cross-section now is dominated by the operator. Uh, and not instead of mixing such as the minimal scenario. And we are we are considering that the HNL in, in the EFT decays via mixing only. So this is what we want to do. I put like a, a, a summary slide here. Different models really mean, I, I, I understand, uh, different ways of different operators that describe the strong interaction part. Yes, yes. But okay. here you perhaps, yes. And this is something that uh, uh, you can go back to a specific uh, 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 model uh, uh, once perhaps you see a, or you can get like, let's say the, like a more concrete way of how to target the signature, let's say. But here we're just trying to think about it systematically, what happens if a heavy neutral lepton is being produced uh, uh, from the decays of uh, a particular meson, and uh, if it's being produced in pairs or perhaps it's singly produced, we look at different operators. I can, uh, we have all the details in the paper, but just put one example here. Uh, 
because then that scenario we not uh, we don't have a way yet to to know whether you, how much constraint it is so so this is where the reinterpretation method i think takes uh, takes a lot of uh, power so you have the minimal framework and like i said before this is a simplified scenario where you have two independent parameters the mass of your heavy neutral lepton the the, the mixing and the experiment or your initial projection uh, will get you the number of expected signal events. And you need to perform Monte Carlo simulations to, to, to get these exclusion limits that are usually fixed in the zero background uh, assumption, uh, which is uh, um, a standard or uh, it's a very nice feature of LLP searches. Then we fix this number to be three, three ex number of expected events. Okay, now, if you consider that your lonely particle is being produced from the same meson or a similar meson, uh, and you consider uh, this other important assumption because otherwise the method breaks down, the lab decay frame of your lonely particle needs to be much larger, larger than the distance from the interaction point to that detector. And this is so you are uh, ensuring that you are uh, uh, not anywhere in the exponential decay probability, but in, 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 in the linear regime with very far decay displacements, okay? And once you do that, uh, you can basically translate those initial limits to a different uh, model parameter space, a prime, let's say, parameter space, which in our case, uh, we define as the mass or mixing or mass and the uh, Wilson coefficient of, of your EFT. And we look at two different models, uh, two different EFTs in the papers, heavy neutral vectors and axion light particles. And the, and the key is that uh, you now have all the input variables for the calculation of your number of expected events in your new model uh, only only from stuff that you can calculate. You can calculate how many HNLs are being produced uh, and you know already the, the, the unprimed quantities which would correspond to the minimal scenario in our case and you calculate your, your decay channels to, to, to get the total decay width. So this is a, diagra uh, a diagrammatic example. We have a signal here in the minimal HNL model, and we are thinking of constraining, uh, let's say, uh, this type of operator that induces uh, decays to pairs of HNLs, or if you think about uh, a, a similar a a nature like LLP, an axion-like particle decaying to, let's say, leptons, the decay is controlled by another parameter, in an analogous way as the as the neutrino light uh, heavier neutrino mixing. So, in order to uh, show you one example now, concrete example, <laughs> uh, I put just one plot from the paper here. So, uh, in the paper, we basically in order to to show the power of the method. We've already done full simulation to this effective field theory, which HNLs that can be produced from, from mesons in, in a previous work, which correspond to the, uh, not the dashed lines, but the full lines. And we overlay here the, the, re, the results of the exclusion that we can get uh, with the reinterpretation method. And you see that most of these lines uh, are, uh, are very close to each other, which means that the method uh, works. And here, this is an example of one particular type of operator, uh, uh, ODN. Uh, so here we have a pairs of heavy neutral leptons in the final state. Uh, what's in gray are current constraints from invisible decays of, of Bs. And, 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 and here you see the colored lines, the prospects of at, at the far detector or transfer detector experiments that I showed. So, this is for two fixed values of the mixing. You can also see uh, plots in the paper where uh, we have this as a function of mixing, but here we wanted to show what is the uh, uh, reach 
in the, in the Wilson coefficient as a function of mass. So Mathusla leads the sensitivity. In, it's, it's a bigger detector. It, 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 it's larger. Um, it leads the sensitivity in most cases. And uh, you can see these X's here in these plots uh, correspond roughly to where our, our, our method breaks down because we are not longer in the in the linear regime of the of the probability decay function uh, and this type of uh, uh, plots uh, are, are are interesting because uh, you can uh, uh, kind of translate these bounds on the wilson coefficients to bounds of the new physics scales that you can reach within your eft and for this particular operator uh, Order tens of TVs can be can be probed. Question. Now, mm -hmm. yes. where are you using the fact that you are living with uh, heavy sort of long lead particles? Because it seems that this can be applied to any process. I mean, any two processes in which you have some parts that are common, and in the in the ratio they cancel something like that. So you use it uh, once you do this. Yeah. Uh, once you quantify the, the probability of that decay. So for an LLP, you know this is an exponential. So depending on this uh, boost factor, uh, you will have, let's say, 60% of the decays within uh, distance x1 and x2. 10% uh, of the decays in, let's say, in the tail of your exponential. And if you don't have a long lead particle, then you won't have decays in this fiducial acceptance. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't work for prompt. Yeah, I mean, it would be great <laughs> if it's a very if it fits very useful but in it, it doesn't work for prompt decays it works for for uh, llps that are you are assuming that these particles uh, are decaying somewhere uh, very far away let's say uh, in in some detector detector acceptance and and how you compute that probability, you need to understand the geometry of your proposed fire detector. So, for example, for Mathusla, you assume a, a big box with certain dimensions. Uh, there are some geometries that are more complicated, so perhaps you need to remove some holes in, in depending on the on the on the proposal. For example, a Nubis is like a cylinder. So you assume that the this is this is your fiducial kind of region. It's a cylinder, not not, not a square, and all these things are relevant uh, in order to catch your LLPs. And this is why these curves, some some designs are are quite similar. This is why the 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 different color lines overlay, but sometimes they're very different. Like phaser is smaller, Mathusla is much bigger. So you will enhance your 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 probability of decay. Um, more questions? Okay, thanks Ivan for, for, for that. And now I wanna show you another model, okay? This is just to show the, the, the power of the method. Uh, you can also think of uh, action like particles uh, as they can also be produced uh, uh, through flavor of diagonal couplings to quarks, they can decay to leptons, and they can also be long-lived. So this is the, the Lagrangian that we're thinking of. Uh, here you have your axion A. The, uh, this term will be important for production. This term will be important for decay. And decays to leptons, uh, it's uh, less constrained. There are many, many ongoing complementary works on, on these references here. But just to show you the kind of exclusions in this uh, CEE coupling as a function of axion mass, at the same fire detector experience that I showed before for a fixed value of this coupling to works, uh, 
these are these lines are only the results of the reinterpretation. Uh, and again, on light gray and gray, you see current bounds. Uh, and with this, we're saying, okay, look, all this far or dedicated long lived particle uh, experimental proposals uh, are able to constrain uh, regions of parameter space that uh, that are already uh, not constrained. <laughs> so, so this helps. This helps a lot uh, also to make the physics case for these experiments. And in the paper, we have several benchmarks, also uh, different uh, uh, mesons. So ALS being produced from these or bees and several uh, production modes of the ALP and always just the simplest case, uh, ALPs decays just, just to uh, electron positive. Uh, and in principle, after, after this works, uh, uh, one of my colleagues has also worked on other models such as uh, light neutralinos in our parity violating SUSI, things like this, where this method can be used and it can be used uh, straightforwardly. You only need to know how to compute uh, your production, your decay. Uh, only rely on quantities that you know how to calculate. <laughs> not necessarily, um, not necessarily, it's very different than the LHC where you have several uh, efficiencies or modules and, 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 and these detectors don't exist yet. So this is what we can do now. And, and I think this is quite nice. Okay, I think uh, I am done. So just as a summary, um, long lived particles are very uh, studied nowadays, also from the phenomenological point of view, because they are predicted in many models that are motivated by uh, giving explanation to neutrino masses and dark matter. The discovery potential at the LHC is very large. I present one example uh, of how CMS could constrain uh, previously unconstrained regions in, 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 in model parameter space for the minimal heavy neutral lepton model, uh, tau mixing. Uh, and also I show you what uh, we can say with the future part detector experiments, future dedicated long lived particle search experiments that are being proposed and all the projections in the theory or the phenoparameter parameter space uh, do rely on uh, how you reinterpret current experimental information or current projections in one particular benchmark model. How do you translate that to new model parameter space is what I, I wanted to highlight in this talk. And we propose a way to do that. Uh, by relying only on Monte Carlo and only for LLPs that are being produced from mesons and that uh, have uh, large enough decay probabilities to ensure that uh, uh, you are in, 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 in the region where uh, you know how to calculate the, the probability of, of decay within certain acceptance in, in this linear regime where this is very long lived, let's say. And I hope I demonstrated that this is useful for constraining new physics models, uh, predicting uh, long lived particles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna, for the very nice and complete talk. Question from the audience? More yeah, questions? I have a question, uh, Joanna. Um, oh. Can you go back to the plot where you were showing the limits on uh, the mixing and the mass of, uh, you know, in, in B decays and D decays? Uh, this one? No, uh, what, 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 yes, this one. So take the one on the right with, uh, with B, B, B mesons. Uh, so um, you, you can see that the lines here, the limits go uh, in mass all the way to a limit, right? Which is a, an upper limit, which uh, of course has to do probably with the mass of the B meson. I mean, you cannot produce mm -hmm. them. Right? But why does the curve go back uh, to lower masses as you go with larger um, mixings? Here you mean? 
But yeah, you see the uh, as you start from you know lower masses, the the, the curve goes down, and, and then it reaches a, a, a kind of a limit, and then it goes back to lower masses again when it goes up, right? Okay, so you mean what uh, what dominates the shape of of, of this curve? Right. So you you follow the curve to the right, and then it goes back to the left. You see. Why does it go back to the ah, left? Why okay, does so, so, have yeah. to be smaller when you have a larger mixing? Why the masses have to be small when you have a larger mixing? Okay, so basically you have longer. So because because the width of this is this we're thinking of HNLs being produced being uh, that the case via mixing. So the total decay width of these guys goes uh, as the mixing square times uh, mn to the fifth power. Right. So for larger masses, you basically have a shorter lifetimes. So right. the sensitivity is bounded by events that are basically decaying too promptly or, or too far away. So this is what determines this, uh, this line. So basically, if you think about the, the prompt searches, the constraints in mixing versus mass are even up, even higher than 10 to the minus four, like 10 to the minus two, perhaps. Well, we can actually take, say this, uh, take a look here. So this Delphi search, for example, 10 to the minus five, okay. Uh, um, I was very <laughs> pessimistic, but most of these bounds here are from prompt searches. They cannot go low in mixing because of of the very nature of the width. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the case. And of course, the the, the bounding mass, uh, you are also, you, you hit the, the Mimeson threshold, you are limited by cross sections. So you always see this type of shapes in, yeah. in, in, in these HNL plots. And, and, and yes, so here your events are decaying. Because you see- in, uh, in... They're escaping, they're escaping, let's say. Because in the case of the D meson, which is the plot on the on the left, you see that the the, the maximum mass is a vertical line. You, you don't go lower as you go up. Okay, but here you see that these curves. If we would have plotted uh, from ten to the zero, you yeah. will see these cells that are closing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, here you can start seeing. Right. Yes. Seeing how they close. Yes. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yes, uh, I, I'm still sort of a little bit, um, sorry, I, I want to say, but uh, worried about the fact that you are using a specific model when which, the, for example, a lonely particle, a specific particle, a uh, fermion or something, and, and it can be it can be other things. I mean, it can be different. Um, so you're using a very specific model, and that's why I'm worried about that a little bit. Huh? Oh, yeah. Just, so just, just something. Uh, but it seems to me that it's quite generic. It's not that specific because basically what you have is a a, a, a massive neutral lepton that has a coupling with the I mean, a coupling or mixing with the normal neutrinos. That's it. It's a very simple, generic thing, right? Yes. Yes, but I think, Ivan, what you mean is that this is the model, this minimal heavy neutral lepton model is the one that we have a first exclusion limit to, to have as a starting point. So Bell and Charm did not look, uh, they, they did not use a benchmark for a, another more complex uh, heavy, uh, neutrino mass model. They use the minimal scenario. So that's that's what we have. We have that yeah, bound, we, we put, have that curve. Let me put my worry a little bit differently. If you write a complete model, meaning which you have all the extra particles on, probably you have going to have another channel. That, that's what I worry about. And then it's trying to think which probably the same particle is going to be somewhere. You, I, I understand you are using, like Claudio said, I mean, a very, very simple thing in which you just put an only particle, some coupling, that's it. 
But if you write a more detailed model which you want to test the model, there are going to be other other particles that are going to couple to this particle probably, and I don't know. Worry about that. Yeah, sure. So in the, in 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 that case, uh, so we are basically testing this method. Uh, not just me, but my, my colleagues are are looking at different models, and like I, it's it's fairly general in the sense that as long as this is produced from the same uh, a meson, you ensure the same kinematics. We 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 we've noticed that this is not. Uh, Dependent on the spin of your LLP, for example, this is why we chose the Alps, the Alps model, uh, etc. Now, if you want to think about your particular BSM model or another model in which you don't want to use these uh, approximations, let's say, you need to go back to the first, uh, the very first, uh, the very first way that I presented in order to perform your reinterpretation. Because if you have several particles that are kind of messing up your decay chains, perhaps your kinematics will be very different. So you don't, you won't necessarily be able to use a method like this one. So you need to basically simulate the response and calculate everything for all your particle spectra. And you can always do that as well. But this way is, uh, well, yeah, I, I believe it's generic enough for light long lived particles being produced from mesons. At least we understand when it breaks down and, and, and when it works. Okay, thank you. More questions from the audience? I had one comment question. For example, Joanna, if we consider, let's say, a model with W prime, for example, a slight symmetry model, it seems to me, but um, you can maybe please clarify that, we, that if the extra diagram which will involve the same as the diagram that you are that is showing in the with the W what W changing by W prime will give us a leading contribution, which will be suppressed by the W prime mass, which will be, let's say, lower than 4 TV. So it seems that maybe if the gauge sector gets extended, the bound will not be will not change significantly. So because of the other extra particle, if you have W prime or, for example, char scalar, if you consider an extended theory with the char scalar sector, Coupling with U bar D, there will be this will, will be other contribution to the production and decay of the heavy neutral electron. However, it seems to me that it may be so leading with respect to the diagram that you are showing. So, so per perhaps with the model. <laughs> uh, so I think in that case, case <laughs> when you change the model, he said. <laughs> Yes. So, well, okay, let me say something. If you have a WR, let's say there, that will affect the kinematics of your process. So we, we haven't tested this when the LLP is being produced from, let's say, the uh, other object that is not a mess. So let in, in you have the bounce in, in the model in your minimal framework, then you want to get the bounce in another model. This methodology works as long as your long lived particle is being produced from the same meson. Okay. If you have an extra WR, I would imagine that this uh, it will be higher in mass than a, let's say a W or whatever, it will alter the kinematics of your process. It will boost away some of the energy. And then you cannot trust that uh, this is a similar uh, kind of process. I don't know, maybe. So I think one, I, one way to check uh, that would be to, to do what we did for the EFT. I... I see somebody wrote something. <laughs> uh, I don't see any message. 
Ah, maybe he, he someone to grow for you. No, no, know. something grow a, a red X on my on, on my on my slide. <laughs> I don't know what that means, <laughs> but anyways, it, I I don't know the answer, uh, uh, Antonio. I don't know if it works if if you have a different production mechanism. The production mechanism uh, of your LLP should be from meson decays. This is where we have tested this. So in principle, yeah, yeah so although you are here, I, I don't see it, but uh, in principle, you can think of UV completions of this, of, of these sets of, uh, in the paper, we have all the operators that we studied, uh, dimension six, four fermion operators, and then perhaps one can do a, a, a matching to a UV completed scenario. So it will imply but... some chaining <laughs> with some coefficient because of the extra new physics, hmm. W prime and extra char scalars. It may be some chaining the Wilson coefficient and maybe the bound from the uh, this, uh, be, this missing matrix element between active and heavy neutrino, this bound will get increased possibly. I yeah, possibly. I mean, I mean this is, I, I'm thinking that perhaps you can do, provided that you respect the assumptions of the method, perhaps an extra uh, square here where you have reinterpreted limits in a more complete model. So you go like it's a, a, an extra third step. Like from the EFT, you go to, to your scenario. Uh, um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yes, I'm just thinking and out loud. Just to be sure that uh, uh, and the, um, in the plot that you were showing the, the, um, from the different experiment, it seems that the, the, the most important point is that the detector will be larger rather than be located at a further region from the interaction point. Because I saw in one of your plots that the Matusla was in the second one, which was larger to the interaction point than the other detector. However, the strongest, exactly, uh, the strongest bound does not come from the faster detector, but rather from the Matusla, mm. maybe because of the site. It's, so yeah, it's a inter... game of size, yes, and, and distance. But than since, the yes. Point. But since we are using this approximation, then you are always ensured that you are at a larger distance from the distance of the interaction point to your far detector. So this is why I think uh, what you're saying is correct. Uh, even though uh, phaser is farther away, it's much smaller. The fiducial volume of this experiment is smaller. Uh, maybe because it's a smaller the detector. So if the, the, yes. detector, the other detector were of the same size of Matusla, then the bound from the from the other detector, from the faster detector, will be even stronger from the from this lifetime and from the missing matrix element from the um, from this uh, missing matrix element U squared that mix active neutrino with heavy neutrinos. I want to share my screen again because I have some one slide on the backup. Uh, do you see this? Ah, uh, yes, I see. Um. Yeah, this I think this slide I put also for for the help. Ah, look, <laughs> uh, Claudio was asking. Yeah, the answer is in this plot to the previous answer by Claudio. Previous question by Claudio: What limits these shapes? But here you can see a representative uh, size of these different propo different proposals. So this is Mathusla. This is a big box. Anubis is also quite large. And codex V is like the third that follows in size. So you can correlate that. You can co kind of correlate that uh, with what you see here. So you see that uh, Mathusla and Anubis are able to exclude uh, the are the most powerful in this sense. Mm -hmm. And next codex V follows. You see, and this is uh, related to, to to how big they are. Mm, yes, because the how, yeah, mm -hmm. because the, the the bigger they are, the the more space you have to catch a particle that is again inside that region. 
So you mm, maximize the probability of decay. Therefore, you maximize the number of expected signal lengths. Thank you, Joanna. More questions from the audience? Thank you, Joanna. Very good talk. Yes, Thank very you. nice talk. Okay, I'm happy you like it. Questions from the audience? More questions? If there are no more questions from the audience, we send Joanna again for the very nice and excellent talk and very complete talk. And we meet at the next seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.